Well, well, welcome back, everybody. I hope you're uh, completely fluent in whichever of the languages you you had a taster of. Um, so that's good. Now you will have noticed also that this, we've got some maps outside, some wonderful reproductions of historical maps, uh, which the, the Kazakh Embassy have put on display for us. Um, there are 16 of these in all, and sadly we agreed that we could only fit four in, uh, which was a great shame. Now, our next speaker is His Excellency Mr. Eliasov, who's the Ambassador of the Republic of Kazakhstan in, in London. He's been a diplomat since 1966, 1996, I beg his pardon. Um, and his postings have included economic and protocol departments in the Foreign Office there. He's been head of the Foreign Policy Centre in the President's administration, as well as a presidential advisor. And before coming to London, he was the ambassador to the Netherlands and Kazakhstan's permanent representative at the United Nations. Um, and I'm very grateful to you, sir, for coming to talk to us today. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for the introduction and good afternoon to everyone. I hope you had a nice break. I've seen that uh, 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 the SOAS has built up for you quite a program of today. I envy you. I said I wish I could be a student and come to such a diverse day. So I hope our presentation will not be uh, boring for you, uh, diplomats from uh, our embassy build up for you a presentation that is a mix of interesting facts, historic individuals, historic uh, trends. So uh, through that, we want to display you Kazakhstan as a country that is not very well known. I would like to express my appreciation to the Royal Society for Asian Studies for choosing Kazakhstan as a country topic for you today. And uh, You've seen the maps, I'll come back to that later, but can I start with asking a question uh, or maybe a request to state one fact about Kazakhstan that you know, that that you think is curious for, please. It's true, thank you very much. Yes. Kazakh language. Yes, I mean, it's a separate language. We speak that language along with uh, Russian and uh, the younger generation speaks English, of course. Please. Partly correct. Uh, indeed, former Soviet Republic uh, used to have the fourth largest nuclear arsenal in the world, bigger than UK, gave it up. So I think these three questions give us the idea of of the country, about the past. And thank you for that former Soviet Union Republic remark, because our task here as an embassy is also to show you Kazakhstan that is beyond Soviet Union. Soviet Union collapsed 30 something years ago. And many people after that saw Kazakhstan, oh, you've been a part of Soviet Union, but our nationhood is much, much older than that. It, it goes back to the 15th century. So in this presentation today, we will introduce you to the History of the Great Steppe, where eventually the state of Kazakhs emerged, and we will, you know, go back uh, centuries and thousands of years ago to give you an idea why Kazakhstan today is the country that it is, why we are multinational, why why we are developing, and what dark pages we had in our history. But also, we'll share with you some interesting facts. I think. Uh, you would take with you and maybe share tonight with some of your friends who skipped today's lecture. But uh, let's go for the next slide. Okay, so the earliest references to the tribes that inhabited modern Kazakhstan territory come from the Persian and Greek inscriptions and writings. One of them is the Greek historian Herodotus. So we're talking about 5th century BC, where he tells that amongst the nomads of the Eurasian steppe, the Scythians and the Saka, 
there was a group of the so-called gold guarding griffins. It's believed that from afar, due to the pointed headdresses and golden decorations, the warriors on the horseback did resemble griffins, therefore the reference. And it also seems that the inspiration for Centaurus in Greek mythology were the nomads of the great, great steppe, the remarkable horsemanship and the archery abilities of the nomadic warriors caused some to imagine that beasts and men were in fact one creature. So here is a first map of the great steppe. So for you to understand, as uh, uh, the first lady said, Kazakhstan is the la ninth largest country in the world. The territory of Kazakhstan is 2.7 million square kilometers, which makes it like 10 times bigger than United Kingdom. Population right now is 19 million people. At that time, even less. So it's huge, vast territory where you had a lot of tribes surviving, fighting, trying to get access to the best places. So as I like to call it, it's kind of like, you know, Game of Thrones part of the world. And uh, But that also was a place where some interesting facts happened. So it is the University of Exeter, and there are many other scientists that prove that domestication of horses first took place in the territory of modern Kazakhstan at that time, as did the culture of horsemanship, which developed later. The ancestors of Kazakhstan were the first to create protective armor for the horse and the rider from armor plates. In 2009, there was an uh, archaeological discovery in Kazakhstan, uh, in north northern part of it, and uh, they found a proof that first people to tame, harness, and use horses for work and ride them were the people of these settlements. And that happened 4,000, 6,000 years ago. So millennia earlier than the previous predictions were. And domestication of horses is an important fa fact for future development of whole human civilization. But the, the first examples of domestication were found in that part of the world. You see this beautiful decoration, Asian decoration. You see the petroglyphs on the stones and carvings, which show that men and horse were together from many, many years ago. Now we jump a little bit in time, and I just want to show you this as an example of a society of nomads where gender equality wasn't become a buzzword 10 years ago. It was always there. We had queens warriors. We had uh, members of the family who were carrying out the same tasks together as uh, with men. They fought together with men. And now uh, Tomides is the proven fact, thanks again to Herodotus, uh, who preserves the story of this queen Tomides of the Masageti tribe, and according to Herodotus, Cyrus, uh, famous for his conquest and expansion of the Persian Empire, intended to seize areas east of the Caspian Sea, which included the area inhabited by the tribes of that queen. And according to the story, he was slain by Tamiris during the standoff. So the women of the steppe tribe played a vital role and were known to fight alongside their men and also the there is a theory that the legend of the Amazons, the warrior woman, also comes from that experience and encounter of Greeks with these tribes. Now, remember the Her Herodotus called these nomads the gold guarding griffins. So this is how the rulers of the steppe dressed like. In 1969, the Kazakhstan Tutankhamun was discovered in a unique burial mound and the skillful craftsmanship of the golden warrior revealed a rich mythology reflecting power and aesthetics of the steppe civilization. The use of the images of animals in everyday life was a symbol for Kazakh ancestors of the interrelation of man and nature, pointing to the spiritual guides of the steppe people. These images were often produced using the highest techniques of the time including the smelting and casting of copper and bronze and the complex manufacturing of gold sheets. So this is an example of very, very intricate jewelry. 
And in Greek mythology, in Greek uh, history, you know, these tribes were sometimes called as the barbarians, wild people of the steppe, not because they were less developed, because they were unknown, and that's why they were kind of uh, a mystery. But they were in no way were uh, less developed than civilization of Greeks at that time. And I mean, this is the example of the craft, craftsmanship of the mm -hmm. people who inhabited the territory of modern Kazakhstan centuries ago. Now, I mean, some of you may, may have tattoos, some of you thinking about tattoos, but tattoos as an art also uh, was very widespread uh, amongst the nomadic tribes of the Great Steppe because animalism was not only jewelry, but also uh, a reflection of the character of the warrior or maybe some kind of a talisman to protect him. And it was believed that these tattoos offered magical protection and also used to commemorate the acts of bravery. The more tattoos were on the body, the longer it meant the person lived and the higher was his status. So these samples, I mean, they look a little bit creepy, but you have to understand that they were found frozen in some uh, glaciers and, and swamps uh, in eastern part of Kazakhstan. So they were basically mummified and due to that preservation, were able to find these bodies with the tattoos that date back 2,500 years ago. But again, an interesting fact, not something that we kind of always tell about Kazakhstan, but to show that the bond between nature and uh, animal world and people and, you know, the spiritual core was very important. Right now, I mean, uh, there's a lot of debates about, you know, the place of religion in our life. But at that time, I think it was it was very, very harmonious for these people. Now, uh, this is the map that shows the span of that great step. Again, huge, huge landmass. And of course, there were movements and migrations of different nations and people. And the tribes were constantly fighting each other, moving, finding the best places. For themselves, they created new unions and states, fought for territory and power, collapsed. Some were forced to migrate to the Middle East, some towards the Indian Ocean and others towards the Black Sea. And through this migration and fight, you know, this is an evolution, not of an individual, but of tribes. So only those who were stronger, more resilient, they, they survived. They were the dominant tribes of, of the Great Steppes. And that's how the character of the nomads was tempered. And the next slide is just one example of a personality. So, I mean, these kind of people would emerge from the Great Steppe. I'm talking about Sultan Baybars and the Mamluk dynasty. So this gentleman was the eminent Mamluk Sultan of Egypt and Syria. And he ruled from 1260 to 1277. But he was born in the steppes of modern Kazakhstan. He was in one of these fights as a young warrior. Then he was imprisoned and eventually he was sold at the slave market in Damascus as a mercenary because he was fit, he had good skills, uh, uh, martial skills, and then he was uh, recruited to be one of the Mamluks who were the personal guards of the Sultan of Egypt. And he grew in the ranks within that, let's say, special force. And eventually he decided that he would seize the throne. And he did. So he threw the Sultan out. He seized the throne. Again, it's like, you know, Game of Thrones uh, scenario. And he established a dynasty which was not a dynasty where the throne will be passed by your relation from father to son. It was among these warriors, they would pick the one who is worthy and he will be the next Sultan because the Mamluks, they were from all around the world because they were mercenaries, the best, but they would come from different countries. And this dynasty was very disciplined, quite successful. They built uh, and rebuilt a lot of infrastructure, mosques, warships, arsenals, and cargo vessels. They united Syria and Egypt at one stage to fight against the Mongol invasion, which eventually was stopped in the Middle East. And then they also fought against the Crusaders. And 
So he died, and I think he's buried in Damascus uh, and in, in Cairo, in Egypt. There's a big mosque, there's a library that bears his name. But this is just an example of a young warrior from these nomadic tribes who traveled across the world, became the sultan of Egypt, created a dynasty that lasted for another 300 years and died with honors and was buried in uh, Damascus, which was the capital of, of Middle East at that time. So uh, something that we're very proud of. And the next individual, I think you know him more. This is uh, famous or infamous King Khan, one of the greatest conquerors and warriors uh, that uh, originates from the territory of modern Mongolia. And of course, over the centuries, the steppe of Kazakhstan saw some of the world's greatest conquerors, including King Khan and Emir Timur. The coming of King Khan's hordes at the start of the 13th century heralded rapid and momentous change in Central Asia. But while the destructive power of the Mongol military was uh, trumped across the world, Less was known that, in fact, if the city or any nation would not fight against them, the Mongols would take them in, they would leave them in peace and continue. So part of the steppe tribes, they actually didn't fight against the uh, army of King Khan. They joined him and they continued the, the, the conquest and uh, were part of the King Khan army that eventually ended up being in the territory of modern Hungary and Austria. And then they had to turn back uh, to Mongolia. So this invasion uh, played an important ro role in shaping basically the, the model of the statehood that the future Kazakhstan will take because eventually the territory of modern Kazakhstan was a part of big uh, empire of Genghis Khan, system of ruling, the administration codes, all was used uh, later on by uh, Kazakh Khans and rulers. Another big phenomenon, which is kind of invisible, so it's not an individual, it's not a conqueror. It's a great Silk Road. It's a trade route. And Kazakhstan was just right in the middle of that crossroad. The unique location of Kazakhstan in the heart of Eurasia has contributed to the emergence of transit corridors between various regions and civilizations. And of course, Silk Road was passing uh, across our country and through that, trade route, the caravans would bring silk and other fabrics, samite, jewelry, glass and leather produce from China to Byzantine Empire to Europe and back. This route was a major transcontinental trade artery until the 14th century when the maritime route was opened and then it faded away. But Kazakhstan was in the middle of that. Basically, imagine there is a big highway and you build a hotel, a restaurant on that highway, and of course, you will meet a lot of people, you will be prosperous, you will learn how to interact with them. So generally, that Silk Road was a kind of highway of the uh, ancient times, and Kazakhs, they hosted these people because they were the keepers of caravans, right? they were guard, guards for the, for the uh, caravans, and they met, represent from different cultures, religions, backgrounds, they learned that there are other interesting people. They learn how to be tolerant, how to be curious, how to adapt the best practices from all these people who would travel across your territory. So that also became later on a part of our national identity, being open, transparent, learning from other experience, being respectful towards each other, whatever the color of your skin or your face is. And that was happening many, many centuries ago. Now, the fun fact. The birthplace of apples. It is scientifically scientifically proven. There's a clip from the Telegraph that the apples originate as a wild fruit in the slopes of the mountains in southern part of Kazakhstan. They were then selected, domesticated, and then they were traded as a fruit along the Silk Road, and they went uh, eastwards towards China, westwards toward Europe. But the birthplace of apples is the territory of Kazakhstan, particular southern part of it, where we have a beautiful city called Almaty, which is translated the father of apples. That's my hometown. And I still believe this is the best place in the world. 
So something for you to know when you next time bite into an apple, you will know that this fruit originally comes from Kazakhstan. Another fun fact, the tulips are originally from Kazakhstan. Because many people think that, that they're coming from the Netherlands, but it's not the fact. The Dutch are very good in marketing tulips, but originally the tulips came from the wild step as a wild step flowers, and they were taken by the Seljuks, one of the tribes of the great step that decided to move out in the search of new lands and eventually ended up establishing the state of Turkey. And the Seljuks brought these flowers. They treated them as a reminder of the great steps that they left. Uh, if uh, you visit Turkey, you see the mosques, the tiles. There is always beautiful depiction of, of the of the tulips on Turkish uh, arts. And then from the court of Ottomans in Istanbul, the 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 bulbs of the tulips were smuggled by, um, if I'm not missing, German monks somewhere in the 15th, 16th century, because it was illegal to take these flowers outside of the court. He brought them to Europe, and then the Dutch uh, continued to uh, grow these flowers and make it into a business. But the fan fact stays as a fact. Kazakhstan is the birthplace of apples and tulips. Now, back to the politics, Game of Thrones, and all this eternal fight for survival. So we are now talking about the formation of a particular Kazakh kingdom, or Hanade, as it was called. Because as I said, they've been different tribes, they've been kingdoms rising and falling, but by the 15th century, uh, a group of tribes decided to unite under the leadership of the two Hans, uh, Sultan Kerei and Jani Bek in 1465, and they decided that they will be stronger together. So these two gentlemen and their uh, commitment to rise as a big power created this union of different tribes, nomadic tribes, who will start calling themselves Kazakhs. But the truth is, and uh, it is an interesting fact, that because it is a union of tribes, it is still can be felt in our society in a very cultural way. Every Kazakh knows actually to what particular tribe he belongs or she belongs. You call yourself a Kazakh, but then if somebody asks what tribe you are from, you know what tribe you are from, and you kind of keep this as a, as a, as a part of your heritage. Uh, so when we say Kazakhstan or Kazakh people, that's absolutely right. But deep down there, we can actually trace ourselves to, to these tribes, to people who, uh, who united uh, into a kingdom many, many centuries ago. Now, Kazakh Hanate or kingdom and the Russian empire. There's the whole slide about this because when we speak about Kazakhstan, we have to speak about your immediate neighbors. In case of United Kingdom, you are on the island and your neighbors are either on that side of the channel or on the next island to you. In our case, it's a landline border. These people cross back and forth and still today the land border between Kazakhstan and Russian Federation is the longest landline border between the states. It's 7,500 kilometers long. So that was a case in the 19th century where the Russian Empire was expanding towards Central Asia. And of course, they started expanding into Kazakhstan. And at that time, Kazakhstan was fighting for survival as a, as a state against the kingdom of Jungars. And the decision was to align with Russia to be able to withstand this pressure from the east the threat from the East, and eventually through that, uh, we saw more of Russian settlements on the territory of Kazakhstan, uh, start building trade points, forts, and eventually uh, it, um, it disturbed the lifestyle of the nomads in many, many ways because Russians pushed them away from their traditional pastures because they said, okay, we're going to build a fort here. You cannot come here anymore. And it was it was a, 
Uh, it was a very uh, trying part of our history because there were people who said we have to fight. There were some wars, but also there were people who said we have to build relations with this big country. But uh, eventually we found a way to interact with uh, Russia and, and had to become a part of a Russian empire. Uh, to survive as a state, and in, initially we were promised a lot of autonomy and independence, but in fact it wasn't really true. So, uh, but things were not going very well in Russia itself. And if you know the world history, in 1917 there was this Russian Revolution, and the monarchy in Russia ended, and the Communists came into power, Bolsheviks, as they were called, and that spread across the whole Russian Empire and reached Kazakhstan. And in 1917, 1920, we had the Alash Orda, which was uh, a model of a, a parliamentary republic that we thought Kazakhstan will have now after the collapse of the monarchy in Russia. But uh, the Alash Orda uh, and their declaration of independence did nothing to alter the terrible economic deterioration in the steppes and for the Kazakh people. So many Kazakhs, they were not very happy with the Alash program and they formed some opposition party and eventually aligned with Bolsheviks. And that's how, after three years of this attempt to create in Kazakhstan a democratic republic, parliamentary republic, we became a part of what was later known as the Soviet Union. And that's where this uh, reference comes that we are the part of Soviet Union. Indeed, Kazakhstan was one of the 15 republics that made Soviet Union for 70 years. And that slide represents what happened in Kazakhstan. And I mean, this was the time when you know, agriculture was developed in industrial scale in Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan became the breadbasket of the whole Soviet Union. Education, infrastructure, in the uh, right bottom corner, you see a rocket taking off, a space rocket, because the first man into space, Yuri Gagarin, went onto that flight from the territory of the Republic of Kazakhstan. So when somebody says from Soviet Union, yes, but that was a part of the Republic of Kazakhstan, and they still take off and land in Kazakhstan because of the vast land mass, because there is some physics involved, but that location is optimal for the launch and landing of the astronauts when there was a disaster in the United States. You remember when the shuttle uh, erupted, the program was shut down for what, seven years. All that seven years, every international astronaut that went into space went into space from the territory of Kazakhstan. Now, the Second World War, because I think it resonates with you, with the United Kingdom's history, when we all fought against the Nazis. And there was a front line here, but there was a Eastern Front. That's where the Soviet Union fought. And still many people think, oh, it's Soviet Union. They say, well, it was probably Russia, Belarus, uh, Ukraine that fought. Uh, but not because it was a union. Every republic thought that they have to be a part of that war and the Republic of Kazakhstan sent 1.2 million people to war and 600,000 never returned. They paid the ultimate sacrifice fighting mostly uh, uh, in European fr fronts and, and battlefields. But uh, we were a very small country. So when we lost these 600,000 people, it meant that 10% of our population uh, was lost forever but we think it was worth it. The fight was worth it. So when we speak about World War II, I think Kazakhstan made a very, very significant contribution to that victory over the, over the Nazis. Now, this is slide from 30s to 50s. Uh, so the World War II happened at that time, and there was this Soviet industrial projects, they would send a lot of people to Kazakhstan to develop that. But most of the people of other nationalities that live today in Kazakhstan, they ended up because 
the Soviet leaders during World War decided to resettle thousands and, and hundreds of thousands of what they considered to be disloyal nationalities from the front lines to Kazakhstan, including 400,000 Volga Germans and large number of the Crimean Tatars. Near the end of the World War II, the Soviet also the Soviets also transferred thousands of ethnic Koreans from far east of Soviet Union to Kazakhstan. So all these people, you see the picture, they were basically loaded in the trains and sent to Kazakhstan because a huge country just dumped them there and they will stay away from the front line and they will not cause any problems for the Soviet regime. So all of a sudden, Kazakhs welcomed all these people because there was no other choice. And in the true spirit of nomadic hospitality, they showed all of these people a second home, a warm welcome, and they stayed and they lived and uh, uh, they still are part of our community. And that brings me to the next slide, modern Kazakhstan. So remember that first slide with the Scythians and Herodotus. I, I tried to briefly show you the, the, the you know, the, the big events, uh, their migration, the wars and everything that shaped Kazakhstan into a modern society. And it is absolutely right that we are large, but we are also very, very rich in subsoil reserves. Uh, we are very multi-ethnic. You see the five top communities, Kazakh, Russians, Uzbeks, Ukrainians, Uyghurs, but we have another 80 different smaller diasporas and communities that have been living in Kazakhstan for many decades. They are a very integral part of our community. They enjoy same rights as everyone. And we have representatives of about 40 different faiths and religions that peacefully coexist in Kazakhstan. There is no state religion in our constitution. The freedom of faith is your personal choice. And that makes us a, a very modern progressive country that first of all respects the right of everyone to pursue their goals and live in peace and harmony, reach uh, creative sporting and professional heights uh, for the sake of our country. Uh, modern Kazakhstan. So these are three pictures that show you the downtown of our capital. And then there is Expo Pavilion and there is Foreign Secretary Cleverly visiting Kazakhstan in March this year. And he asked for that outfit and that picture. So just make sure, uh, sure they understand that he wasn't like wearing this throughout his visit. He was visiting one of our kind of ethnic pavilion to showcase our <clears throat> culture. And he said, can, can I hold that eagle? Because Kazakhstan is also a place where the eagle hunting originated as, as an art and craft centuries, centuries ago. It's still a part of our national heritage. We have championships on eagle hunting, a very fascinating sport that recently has been revived. But again, this picture shows that Kazakhstan is an important global player that is recognized by US, UK, European Union, countries of the Gulf by Russian Federation and China. We have diplomatic relations with most of the countries around the world, except for some far away, uh, maybe islands in the Pacific, because just physically it doesn't make sense and it's, it's a long distance. But otherwise, we enjoy these relations. We have a very strong presence of uh, businesses from all these countries in Kazakhstan being rich in natural resources. And we are building our future. This is Astana. This is our capital city. And you can see by architecture that it's uh, it's new. It's vast. There is a lot of space. It's very modern. and this one is Almaty, the birthplace of apples, also a very modern, interesting city. That is very unique case because it's very close to the beautiful mountain. So if any of you is into skiing or snowboarding, there's a great uh, place to, to do something in the city and then take take a car or bus. And in, in 30 minutes, you can be going down the slope 60 miles per hour. Uh, again, it's a glimpse of, of our cities and architecture. And this is a glimpse of our people because we are very proud, as I said again, about our multi-ethnic, multinational community that is very creative. They try to prove themselves in sports, in arts. You see some award winners, uh, that young man uh, uh, in the leather jacket, 
he won Grammy last year for the best remix. And I know you've heard that song many, many times, but you don't know that it was remixed by the Kaza guy. He was actually a part-time railroad worker. So he's not a professional DJ, but in the, his spare time, he he liked to remix things and eventually his mix won the Grammy. Then we have uh, boxers, uh, football players, actresses, the lady in the far right corner, Rubakina, she won uh, Wimbledon last year. Uh, again, uh, a fun fact about Kaza. So all these people, they represent a young, dynamic, open-minded country that is very proud of its history that is much more than former Soviet Republic. I think now you know that we have a very long history and that enjoys very good relations with uh, many countries. And that has a lot of young people of your age who are also very open-minded and, and curious about the world. So uh, with that, I will end my presentation and I'll leave it to questions and answers. Thank you very much. So please, Any if you questions? feel, yeah. Uh, please, at the back. So the question was how the people reacted. When, if you talk about uh, people uh, on the street, uh, ask them, uh, it's different views because if you looked at the breakdown, the ethnic breakdown, breakdown of our country, we have a big Russian community, uh, and the, most of the people in Russian community, they align themselves with with the information that comes from Russia. So they said, "Well, this is a special military operation. I think they're doing the right thing." Most of the ethnic Kazakh people, they 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 were not that inclined to believe uh, to the information from Moscow from Russia. And they were very sympathetic with Ukrainians because, you know, generally it, it's wrong when a country, any country in the 21st century rolls into the tanks in the neighboring country and just start, you know, proving their point. And uh, it went to the extent that people in Kazakhstan would uh, collect uh, humanitarian aid. Uh, our government sent about three planes with, with different humanitarian aid, including uh, heat generators last winter. Uh, if you follow some uh, social media in Ukraine, they've been uh, these uh, yurts of resilience. Yurt is a, is a, is a nomadic tent, you know. Uh, and in Ukraine, some Kazakh businessmen, just out of individual desire to show their support to Ukrainian people, they sent these tents and they were open in different cities because people could go there, have some you know hot food, recharge their phone. So on, on, on that people-to-people -people contact, it was this split according to the communities, but uh, generally uh, we are not uh, we're not approving what's going on because uh, it's not it's not the time when you settle things through the warfare. Please, lady at the back. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, uh, if you follow the news uh, since 2021 uh, in Kazakhstan, there is a political transformation that is taking place. We've had last year uh, elections to referendum on the amendments to the constitution. Then we had, according to that amendments, uh, elections to the parliament and elections of the president. And those are to pay attention to because they were different. Uh, they were different from what happened before. Yes, we, we had uh, issues with some transparency uh, with the past elections. But again, you have to pay very close attention to our past. 70 years in the, in the former Soviet Union still bears that impact on, on how people see themselves. Because it used to be that people say, well, I mean, the government is somewhere up there. We are here, they have nothing to do with us. Uh, so let them, you know, run these elections the way they want. Right now, it's about government for people and not the people for the government. So I would encourage you to watch what's going on in Kazakhstan because we are changing because of what you said. We are not very happy with what happened in the past. We are doing our best to change. And for that, we need more partnership. But I think the fact that 
Foreign Secretary Cleverly visited in Kazakhstan for the first time as a Foreign Secretary of UK visit Kazan in 18 years was 18th of March, one day before the parliamentary elections in Kazakhstan. That was a sign that UK encourages Kazakhstan to do more. He went there, he delivered that message, and I think uh, we are on the right path, but it will take time. Yes. Mm. Uh, I would lie if I say when I was a kid, I always dreamed to be an ambassador because uh, the reality was I was born in Soviet Union and the Soviet Union, you know, the whole foreign policy was exercised from Moscow. So being born in Almaty in Kazakhstan, you had a very, very, very slim chance to make, to make it up there. So I wasn't really into that. But in 1991, when our country became independent, all of a sudden I realized and everyone realized we have to have our own foreign policy. We have to have our own army and banking system. So there was new this these new professions that were in demand. And I then I decided I would try. I would do my best to represent my country. I, I did my university degree in foreign relations uh, and London, when, when you are in the system, London is one of the top destinations in the world. I mean, there's like, you know, big five. I mean, there is London, there's Washington DC, there's United Nations in New York, there might be Geneva or France, but London is the global capital because of the influence of this country to the uh, global agenda about the economic uh, opportunities for countries like ours from UK. So uh, I'm very honored to be posted to United Kingdom. It's a great mission, and I'll do my best to accomplish it successfully. Well, Ambassador, thank you very much indeed. We're going to need to stop to move on to lunch. It, it, it's nice to hear that <clears throat> there are attractions to coming to London. I suspect that uh, quite a lot of us here would wonder if that was the case. <laughs> um, so, Ambassador, thank you very much indeed.